this is Carrie Cassidy from Project Camelot, and uh, we are going to be doing a live interview tonight with Mark Nowitzki, the National Security Whistleblower. And so I uh, hope everyone is, is ready for this. <laughs> Should be a lot of fun and very, very interesting. I do have Mark on the line right now. Mark, uh, can you say hello? Hi, Carrie, and uh, thanks for the opportunity, and I appreciate uh, the, the uh, insightful people that are following your program. Excellent. Well, uh, I'm really happy to have you on the show, and uh, it, it's a lot of fun to, to kind of do this with you. Uh, we, we won't have any interruptions, at least by any formal commercials, although uh, I'm not sure what the live stream does. We do use a free part of their app, <laughs> just so you know. Uh, but eventually this is going out over YouTube, as I mentioned to you, behind the scenes, and so everyone will know that if they miss any part of this, it will stay on live stream as well and be streamed uh, constantly at your your request, uh, but for free, and then also go on to YouTube. So so that's what we have going on with this interview tonight. So uh, we, we interviewed Karen Hudis actually a few times, and we did a live stream with her as well, and mm -hmm. um, a while back, as you know, and I know you work closely with her. So what I wanna do, I, I know you've got a subject you wanna go right into, but before you do that, I do want you to introduce yourself. Um, I've written a, a few things on the introduction, the article on my site about you, uh, linking over to that very uh, good article by uh, Preston James over at uh, Veterans Today. But I'd like you to kind of give your background kind of briefly, and we will go back in more depth into your background. So just say what you want at this point, and I'm glad to go into the topic that you want to discuss right from the get-go after that. Sure. Well, I kind of, you know, backed into being a uh, national security whistleblower. And as everybody can now imagine, uh, this is beyond national security. This is international security. And you, we are not any safer as a result of spying on every single American in the country, let alone literally every person in the world. Uh, we have been exponentially been made much more uh, in harm's way um, our allies no longer are our friends. Um, we have alienated and isolated ourselves. Um, and uh, our companies like uh, uh, Yahoo and Google and Facebook and, and Twitter, uh, our hardcore companies like uh, uh, Hewlett Packard are complaining that nobody wants to do business with us because they're afraid of back doors in, in our uh, hardware, in our equipment. Um, and they're afraid of, you know, just opening Pandora's box and giving every information from a, from a country uh, to the United States government for, for purposes unknown, uh, friend and foe. Um, but uh, I, I started out um, in how I ended up being a national security whistleblower. Uh, I worked for a company called Teletech Holdings in Denver, Colorado. Uh, Teletech Holdings is a multi-billion dollar international holding company that uh, works in the industry of electronic customer relations management, uh, customer service, uh, international call centers. Um, so basically they interact at the customer service level for a variety of industries and services from telecommunications to retail to financial to healthcare. Uh, they also have a special subsidiary called Teletech Government Solutions that's involved with the uh, Department of Homeland Security the FBI, with um, FEMA, and with the State Department. Um, I worked for a subsidiary called Nugen Results um, at the time. And again, I don't know how in-depth you want to go into this, but uh, uh, Nugen Results served the retail automobile industry. And uh, what we did for uh, manufacturers and retail uh, dealers throughout the country was uh, have access to the individual dealer's database and then marketed promotional materials to their customers. Um, but very soon, as a, a senior management level responsible for customer retention, customer satisfaction, um, I ascertained that the company was actually stealing from our customer base by using algorithms that were developed intentionally to deceive and defraud our customer base. And, and the company, by my estimations, was dealing between 30 and 40 percent in overbilling and fraudulent overcharges um, per month. Now, this represents a significant revenue. 
Um, and so the fact that they were aware of this and then, uh, you know, disclosing, failing to disclose this information to the shareholders um, actually uh, is a securities fraud. Um, the other concern I had was that the company uh, was barely sharing information uh, based on information and belief um, from the dealerships to third parties, certainly without the knowledge or consent of the individual dealers. So what the company, you know, was doing and, and what I had uh, seen was that the company was sharing private, confidential, proprietary customer information um, with a third party without the individual dealer's knowledge or consent, um, which is a crime. And uh, ultimately, I ended up getting sued by Teletech and Federal Court in Denver. Um, the uh, lawsuit against me was completely without merit, uh, was not based on evidence, uh, you know, and it was, you know, a circus. It was a kangaroo court. Um, my attorneys, uh, my first attorney is actually um, ended up uh, quitting on me because they, uh, in, it's my belief that uh, they were, um, they knew what was going on and they knew that they were going to be outspent. Um, I received a, a new set of attorneys and um, we ended up actually uh, basically uh, pro se on my part, uh, forced a dismissal with prejudice against this multi billion dollar corporation. Um, and I thought that my life would be, you know, fine and good. Um, what ended up happening as well in the very beginning of the lawsuit, and this happened in March of 2002, I received a warning from two former CIOs of the company saying that um, Teletech had the capacity uh, to wiretap my phone lines and read my ISP and that I was going to be under attack, um, that um, – uh, they considered me to be their number one priority um, and that they were going to litigate me to death and I would never work again. Now, this was in 2002, and people were starting to talk then about um, uh, domestic surveillance and the necessity for domestic surveillance. Um, and after the dismissal of the lawsuit, I, I had received numerous threats uh, I won the dismissal, and I thought, well, great, I can I can uh, resume my life. And um, but what I found out was that I was literally unemployable. Um, it appeared that I was put on some type of a list, and uh, I had uh, foreknowledge that Teletech was involved in things like uh, uh, the establishment of the terrorist watch list. Now, when people think of the NSA, the National Security Agency. It should really be called the PSA for the private security agency because 70% of the, uh, of the uh, budget for the NSA goes to private contractors. And this is for the purpose of evading scrutiny by Congress and oversight and, you know, nasty things like uh, Freedom of Information Act requests. And um, from there, I did everything that, uh, you know, a whistleblower could do, but I found myself unemployable. And... Um, when you are a national security whistleblower, um, let me tell you, I, you know, the hurdles and boundaries put up against you. For one thing, um, it appeared as if I, the, my uh, prospective employers were being contacted and warning them not to employ me. So I had circumstances where I had companies that I had interviewed with, and I was, I was at, in demand. I had headhunters when I was working at Teletech at Nugent that were calling me basically on a weekly basis asking me about different opportunities. And um, so I disclosed to these prospective employers that, you know, I was in the process of, of being sued by my former employer, that the allegations were without merit. So I had full disclosure at the front end. And, uh, you know, after that, I told them that, you know, the case was dismissed with prejudice in my favor, meaning that Teletech could never come back after me, uh, making the same allegations. Um, because, again, you know, the uh, allegations in the lawsuit was completely without merit. It never should have seen the light of day in the judicial system. Um, and I had things like um, a federal judge that was overseeing the case uh, came up to me in a settlement conference and, and put his arm around me and started to cry. And he said, Mark, um, if you were my son, I would tell you just drop this. You can't win. Just, you know, 
um, um, you know, take it, uh, you know, let this go, um, get on with your life. And I, I looked at him and I said, I don't understand what you're telling me. I mean, you're, you're telling me that I don't have rights of due process or equal access to the courts. And I said, how do you come to work every day? You take an oath to God to protect the rights of the defenseless and the oppressed. And you're telling me that I can't compete uh, even though that I've done nothing wrong and the other side doesn't have any evidence to back up their claims. And, you know, this is, you know, by everybody's account, a, a hostile and malicious attack. Um, but it become then that I understood the power of domestic surveillance and how domestic surveillance was not being used in our national interest. It was being used as a weapon. It was being used against whistleblowers. It was being used against uh, government employees. It was being used against journalists. It was being used against lawyers. It was being used against judges. Um, it was being used for commercial purposes. Yeah, domestic surveillance was all about opposition research and control. So recently, when things like the fusion centers were actually forced to concede that, um, you know, they, despite, I, I forget when it was, $600 million dollars, in monies that were spent in developing these fusion centers, how many actual event, terrorist events that they had uh, negated or stopped or prevented, and they had to admit it was zero. And recently, um, uh, the head of the NSA, General Keith Alexander and, and James Clapper, the head of the Department of National Intelligence, um, were asked earlier how many um, uh, terrorist events they had uh, negated or prevented or uh, and uh, I think they, they said 54. Um, now they had to come back because I've never seen two people with the ability to lie and mislead and perjure themselves in front of Congress when they recently had to admit that, well, we think it's like one. We stopped one event, and that was a taxi driver, I think, in New York uh, that I believe was Somali, and he ended up sending back $1,000 to some Somali organization that was perhaps affiliated with a group. <laughs> right. Crazy. Uh, okay. so, so, you know, when we're being told that, you know, domestic surveillance is our friend, um, that it's, it's protecting us, there's no evidence of that. And the evidence is all to the contrary. And, you know, th that can be clearly exhibited by, uh, I have to, your, uh, Senator Feinstein, and uh, I would just like to talk to your audience about um, how completely clueless and incompetent and inept and dangerous she is. Um, she's head of the Senate Intelligence Committee, um, and she was the biggest cheerleader for the NSA, and she was the biggest protectorate of the NSA, and there wasn't a citizen she didn't feel that uh, uh, could not be spied upon. Um, so 10 years ago, when uh, people like myself were trying to warn Congress, trying to warn the media, trying to warn the judiciary, that um, pretty much all of our communications are being monitored and recorded uh, and being held in, in, in a database. Um, you didn't have to be a terrorist or you didn't have to be on a terrorist watch list to have this happen. Um, Ten years ago, people would have looked at us like, you know, we're absolutely crazy, and now we all know that it's happening all over the world. But Diane Feinstein, and it was very interesting because, again, if you looked at, um, you know, she referred to um, Edward Snowden as a traitor, and what he did was treason. And uh, she attacked anybody that would, uh, you know, go after the NSA and what they were doing. But something happened in the past week. I was kind of curious. And um, it was reported that uh, apparently the NSA has been spying on our allies and uh, our uh, allied diplomats up to the president level. So we're spying on countries like uh, Germany and Mexico and Spain and France. And uh, apparently that was where the straw that broke the camel's back as far as Diane Feinstein, because apparently it was okay with her if, you know, if the common people were, were spied upon. But she drew the line when uh, the NSA was spying on politicians. So suddenly, after all of this cheerleading and uh, going after and attacking whistleblowers like Ed Snowden, 
when she found out that uh, the NSA was spying on politicians, she released a scathing statement. And she said, unlike the NSA's collection of phone records under a court order, which is a lie because they don't need a court order, it is clear to me that certain surveillance activities have been in effect for more than a decade and that the Senate Intelligence Committee was not satisfactorily informed. Therefore, our oversight needs to be strengthened and increased. She said, with respect to NSA collection of intelligence on leaders of U.S. allies, including France, Spain, Mexico, Germany, she left out Brazil, by the way, uh, Dilma uh, Rousseff, let me state unequivocally, I am totally opposed. And she said, unless the United States is engaged in hostilities against the country or there is an emergency for this, uh, an emergency need for this type of surveillance, I do not believe the United States should be collecting phone calls or emails of friendly presidents and prime ministers. The president should be required to approve any collection of this sort. And in closing, she said, Congress needs to know exactly what our intelligence community is doing. To that end, the committee will initiate a major review of all intelligence collection programs. Right. Excuse okay. Me. Well, I mean, how do you how do you actually look at her reversal, though? Um, do you see it as superficial, or do you see it that she realized on on some sort of deep? Hello. Yes. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, we we just had an interruption. Uh, hopefully, you're going to be seeing us shortly. Even now, I think you can see us now. Uh, so sorry about this. It's uh. It's just one of those things where we're used to this kind of stuff. So, <laughs> okay, Mark. Uh, so I was, I just asked you about how you viewed the Diane Feinstein kind of reversal and you were explaining uh, that she should really be, uh, of course, and obviously she's, she's more than aware of the surveillance, all levels of the surveillance, nothing is a surprise. Um, but, but why the politicking? What, what do you think she, uh, she thinks she's going to achieve by that? reversal she's trying to save her own butt right um she, she's realized now that the lights are on that uh, you know that this is completely um out of uh the protectorate uh and more and more knowledge is you know more and more information is coming out and again i mean i would like to applaud um uh, edward snowden for what he's done um it you know it took a tremendous amount of courage and actually uh, you know, anybody that's going to be critical of him, I think what he did was he, he took a critical analysis of the way whistleblowers were treated that were speaking out about domestic surveillance. And, and I, I, who I'm talking about are, you know, people like Michael Hastings, who was recently killed. Absolutely. Uh, and how about Aaron Swartz? How about uh, Bradley Chelsea Manning? Um, and how about, uh, you know, President Obama going after whistleblowers with the bloodlust? Um, so he looked at what happened to Thomas Drake. He looked at what happened to William Binney. And he said, you know, this is information that has to get out. And anybody that would be critical of Ed Snowden, who said, and I can't in good conscience allow the U.S. government to destroy privacy, Internet freedom, and basic liberties for people around the world with this massive surveillance machine they're secretly building. Boy, what a, what a horrible guy. Now, <laughs> okay, where, so I appreciate that, although I've got some mixed reviews in the background as far as, you know, the fact that he had help and, uh, and the fact that, that there is some kind of game playing going on with the Russians in this regard. Um, and I know you were on Russia today, and, and there's, there is a whole dynamic that, that I do want to kind of talk to you about. It's a more subtle level, but it has yes. to do with, uh, with kind of um, one-upmanship, if you will, between Russia and the U.S., uh, in other words, one surveillance committee calling, it's kind of like the, what they say, the, the pot call it, calling the, the pot black or whatever it is. You know what I'm the saying? calling the kettle black. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, come on, let's, let's get real. I mean, didn't Russia basically invent the surveillance society and suddenly they're, they're holier than thou, they're above, above all this. Yeah, right. Uh, I don't believe that's how they conduct their, their business in their own country. And I also don't believe that they're not also reciprocally spying on us. Uh, so this is a, a very key thing to keep in mind and to balance the scales a little bit. We Yes, the NSA is, is this incredible uh, nefarious in, 
uh, sort of uh, intelligence agency, but but we've got that uh, across the board. People are spying on people all around the world, agencies upon agencies. Uh, it, it's like, I think of it as, like the Keystone Cops, to be honest. Um, <laughs> You know, they're stumbling yeah. over each other to, to, to watch and listen to each other. It's craziness. Okay. Well, I, I, but what we need to talk about is legitimate versus illegitimate spying. Sure. I am. I, I served in the United States military. Uh, MOS was 95 Bravo, 95 Char Char Charlie Combat Military Police and Corrections. I, I had some experience in psychological operations. And I understand that, you know, we need to direct our energies it, it towards uh, uh, national security. But as has just been admitted publicly by the head of the NSA, by the director of national intelligence, and by the head of the fusion centers, they haven't been effective at doing that. And so uh, uh, apparently um, UPS guy could have figured out with, um, uh, oh, geez, what was his name? In Aurora, Colorado. Um, why can't I think of his name? Uh, um, uh, not Adam. Was it Adam? No, that was the uh, Sandy Hook. Yeah, well, uh, <laughs> um, the uh, the shooter in in uh, the suspect in, in Aurora, Colorado, right. James Holmes. James Holmes. Yeah. Um, that uh, the UPS guy could have figured out that you know he's delivering boxes of ammunition and boxes of of uh, uh, ballistic uh, protective gear, and you know he was on the internet ordering all of this stuff. Um, the Sennar brothers. I mean, the Russians tipped us off to those guys. Um, and we, we, we failed to take action, failed to respond. Uh, we had uh, 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 Hassan at Fort Hood. Uh, he was all over the internet. Uh, you know, we, so, so you know, we didn't prevent that. We could, you know, if, if we had something that we could hang our hat onto. But what I'm saying is, if they're spending all of their time listening to Mark Nowitzki and Terry Cassidy and Karen Hudis and uh, Aaron Swartz. And that's, you know, uh, basically, uh, you know, everybody, everybody else, um, you know, you're not talking about trying to find a needle in a haystack. It, you know, it's impossible. So, yes, I am all for protection of our national security interests and preventing terrorism by going after um, people that, you know, seek to do us harm. And there's a lot of things that we can do to prevent that from happening that don't involve spying on journalists or going after employees of the FDA that are trying to prevent uh, uh, hazardous uh, medical products and devices from getting promoted. Um, right. Uh, you know, okay, that, well, that, let me ask you, and, and we, we haven't actually turned down that road that you wanted to go to first, so I'm going to remind you of that here, but I also want to ask you because – it appears that as a result of your whistleblowing, you became a subject or subjected to uh, harassment and surveillance that was overzealous. And I was hoping that um, you don't necessarily have to answer now, but I'd like to hear you explain how that manifested for you. Sure. You mean what it's like to be on the receiving end of illegal government domestic surveillance? Yeah, as much as I, you know, I'm going to pretend that I've not myself experienced that, but for the p purposes of the interview here, sure. um, no, you know, yes, absolutely. That, uh, you know, I think that, you know, it would be good for people to hear your direct uh, experience. Sure. And, and what I like to do is I like to use history as a guide and because history is simple. Uh, it's self-explanatory. It's irrefutable. And it's, you know, best used as a, a determining factor of, of future events. But if you want, want to get to the point that I just want to quickly make, um, and because this just came out today, um, and it deals with the uh, Trans-Pacific Free Trade Agreement. Um, they actually changed the name because Trans-Pacific Free Trade Agreement uh, didn't sell well and wasn't trending properly. Uh, so they changed the name to the Trans-Pacific Partnership. But what this is, if people remember under the Clinton administration where we had NAFTA, CAFTA, GATT, WTO, um, these free trade agreements where uh, a, a very intelligent person by the name of Ross Perot in a presidential debate with H.W. Bush and Bill Clinton uh, set a, a very stunning and articulate and well thought out uh, premise that if we get involved in these free trade agreements, the jobs are going to be sucked out of the United States. Uh, and we are going to reduce uh, the cost of labor in our country 
and we are going to increase our rate of unemployment. Um, so it, it's not like people didn't see this coming. But um, if you thought that NASA cap, the GAT, WT, you know, uh, as if we didn't outsource enough jobs, I think it's 70,000 factories. Um, there was a notice sent out today by the Hill and by Politico that the Senate Finance Panel are trying to get um, passage of fast-track authority for the Trans-Pacific Partnership. So what, what your listeners need to do if they're not familiar with this is simply Google or search Trans-Pacific Partnership, or TPP, in fast-track. Now, what fast-track is, is it, it allows for legislation to go through very quickly with an up-or-down vote in Congress. Um, so there's very little investigate, you know, so this is a very covert and secret way. And I believe that they're using the cover of um, the Obamacare debacle uh, to get this through uh, without, you know, um, uh, having a lot of the public, uh, you know, be aware of, of, of this. And essentially what you're looking with the Trans-Pacific Free Trade Agreement is whatever jobs are left are going to be outsourced. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, offshore, um, it's going to free up banksters from even less oversight. Um, it's going to ban by American provisions. Um, it's going to decrease our access to medication and generic drugs. Um, it's going to eliminate uh, uh, things like EPA regulations and FDA regulations with regards to, to uh, uh, unsafe food and products. It's going to override the U.S. health and environmental standards. It's going to free up genetically modified organisms. Um, and it basically what it's going to call for, it's, it's basically an elimination of American sovereignty. Um, and what it's going to do is there's going to be corporate international tribunals made up of corporate lawyers that are going to have the necessary or uh, oversight over all of these things like financial regulations or banking provisions, international, um, you know, food safety, drug safety. Um, and that's all in part to joining this Trans-Pacific Partnership. And so people need to get informed about this. Now, the, the initial countries in the Trans-Pacific Partnership are the United States, Japan, Canada, Mexico, Australia, New Zealand, Peru, Chile, Singapore, Vietnam, Malaysia, and Brunei, but it's open-ended. So once they establish this, countries like China or, you know, anybody else would be able to jump into this thing. And basically, it is an elimination of, of uh, American sovereignty on all of these issues. It's NAFTA, CAFTA, GATT, WTO on steroids. And uh, we cannot allow um, the, the, the disinformation and the diversion of the Obamacare debacle preclude us from having stopped the Senate for giving fast-track authority to the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Okay, okay, very, I hope that, very good. I hope that made sense to people. Yeah, um, it, very interesting, and uh, this brings to mind uh, also Obamacare in general and what that's really about, which I do want to drill down with you. But before we do that, let's let's just go back one step and have you answer how directly you were affected by uh, by domestic uh, surveillance uh, of yourself uh, after your whistleblowing or or right even during the whistleblowing and, and what you experienced in terms of harassment and perhaps what you're also experiencing to this day. Okay. Well, let me do it. Let me do that by, by first saying this, uh, there's a national security whistleblower coalition and the senior academic advisor's name is William Weaver. And this is what, uh, the national security whistleblowers coalition senior academic advisor has to say about national security whistleblowers. When I get calls from people thinking of blowing the whistle, I tell them, don't do it. Most of the time they go ahead and do it anyway and end up with their lives destroyed. Those who come forward often face harassment, investigation, character assassination, and firing, not to mention the toll that whistleblowing takes on their families. If you do it, you will be destroyed. Sometimes people ask me, should I do this? And my answer is no. If they're married, they'll lose their family. They'll lose their jobs. They will lose everything. And uh, the uh, Project on Government Oversight had this to say, the only way we can find out what's going on is for someone to come forward and let us know. But when they do, 
the weight of the government comes down on them. The message is, don't blow the whistle or we'll make your life hell. Now, these are the advocates for national security whistleblowers. And um, Okay, well, you know, I, I mean, you know, I appreciate that, although because I'm a website that <laughs> friends... Uh, or whatever bring, exposes, brings to the light whistleblowers in their testimony uh, from above top secret. I can appreciate all of that. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure it, it actually uh, works. In other words, they're perhaps trying to discuss something that, that they, they should have balanced it a bit because on the one side, yes, there are some sacrifices that can be made uh, not always have to be made, but can be made in terms of uh, a spouse perhaps not understanding what's going on and, and, and the surveillance intensifying, et cetera. But I can guarantee you that uh, if, if a person continues with a certain amount of knowledge anyway, their, their days are numbered regardless. So that whether they go public, it becomes uh, the difference between being targeted uh, and killed and just going into obscurity or actually possibly becoming so well known uh, that they don't want to make you a martyr and they won't, uh, they won't then kill you. So there are, there are aspects to that, that discussion, but I appreciate, you know, the point you're making that it's, that it's a hard road um, and that they are making the national security whistleblowers coalition, not sure who they're really working for, but um, right. you know, I, I mean, excuse me if I'm a bit skeptical of, of everything. So but can you again? Can you talk about what did happen on a personal level? Are you are you willing to talk about that? Well, yes. I mean, I, I basically found myself unemployable, and it was almost as if I was on some type of a list. And that's when the um, you know the terrorist watch list came out, and I understood that there were uh, companies that were private contractors that were overseeing that for the government. Now, Teletech has a subsidiary called Teletech Government Solutions. Um, Teletech also has a direct link to the uh, Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, or DARPA. Um, Teletech seems to have a proclivity of, and I was warned that Teletech had, high, had friends in high places. And again, I was warned that I would never work again. Now, when I heard that, you know, I, I thought, you know, how can they make that happen? You know, trust me, they can and, and here's what happens to a whistleblower, as, as I'm certain that you know. Um, for one thing, employers are scared of bringing you on because, as, you know, they look at the fact that, you know, maybe here's somebody who has to think that everything has to be absolutely right or perfect and that, you know, um, that they're will you know, that we are willing to question their challenge authority. Um, and so if, if they have somebody, if they're judging two people, and if they have somebody that was a whistleblower uh, to the point where, you know, their company, you know, initiated a, a federal legal action against them, even though it was dismissed with prejudice, if I've got somebody that, you know, I think I can trust or intimidate, I'm not going to take the whistleblower. Um, what happened with me was that um, immediately after receiving these warnings, um, I had companies coming to me, and so I interviewed with them over the phone. The first uh, company was out of California, and it was in, within the same industry that I came from, which was uh, electronic customer relations management for the retail automobile industry. And uh, we hit it off. It was great. Uh, we had a couple of phone interviews. I did some uh, psychological testing over the phone, and, and they were extremely happy and pleased with that. And they said, we're going to send you, a, you know, a plane tickets, hotel confirmation, car rental confirmation. We need to get you out here as quickly as possible. Um, so the next day I received a priority FedEx came. Uh, and then later that afternoon I got a phone call and they said, well, we're going to go another way. And I said, well, I, I don't understand, um, uh, you know, everything, you know. And they said, well, you know, we, we something has come up and we're not able to do this. And I'm thinking... You know, you just spent three grand on, on plane tickets and on everything else. And they said, well, you know, uh, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll look to give you a call back in six months or so. And I thought that that was very odd. Um, and, but, they, you know, there was nothing I could do. Then I was interviewing with a company out of Florida, and it went the same way. And uh, actually, very much the same way. They sent me a, a FedEx pack, and, and the next day, he called me back. And that's when I said, something's up. I mean, it's like somebody tipped them off. They got they, they got a phone call. Um, the other thing is that 
uh, you know, they get a phone call. Uh, there's a, a program called InfraGuard um, that uh, many major corporations are involved with. It's uh, part of the Department of Homeland Security and FEMA and the military, and it basically has to do with uh, uh, COG or uh, continuity and government operations. And in the event of national security, they, they have to have uh, uh, an affiliate within, you know, a lot of these corporations. And it was reported that uh, somebody involved in, with InfraGuard said, uh, well, listen, if you have a, a problem employee, just let us know and we'll take care of it. Um, and uh, as the, you know, Preston James in uh, the Veterans Today article has pointed out and has been my experience um, in understanding that um, typically what happens is this. Um, a prospective employer or an employer um, will make a visit to your, uh, you know, a prospective employer in their place of business and say, well, listen, you know, Mark, uh, we just need to talk to you about Mark Nowitzki. We need to get some background information. Um, he's, you know, currently under investigation. Um, we don't think it's a real serious issue, but, um, you know, we, we just think that perhaps you would, you know, choose another uh, person for that position, or, you know, we don't think that uh, he should no longer be in your employee. And by the way, here's a national security letter. Why don't you read this? And it says it's illegal for the employer uh, to make a reference to having seen this information or, or be aware of this visit. Um, and it, I think the penalty is 10 years in prison and, and a $10 million fine or something along those lines. And then they pull the national security letter back. Um, and so... Uh, those types of things. Now, the longer this goes forward, the longer you're unemployed or underemployed or unemployable. Um, uh, and again, I mean, I went through the same thing that William Weaver described. I went through the same thing that many national security or, or just whistleblowers have survived, um, is that, you know, they, they do lose their family. They do lose their children through, the, through divorce. Um, they become virtually unemployable. The longer you are unemployed, the worse it is for you. Um, I'm 50 years old now at this point. Um, when this started, I was in my early 40s. Um, you know, so you got that against you. Then you're bankrupt, and then you have bad credit. Um, and, you know, all of these things pile on top of you. Um, Right. And I, I mean, I appreciate that. Uh, what I would actually call that is is, is breaking from the matrix. Uh, in other words, real indication that you are uh, stepping out and, and making a, taking a stand against, against this thing we call the matrix, which is uh, a, a false reality uh, for all intents and purposes. And in other words, that is uh, the price of, of becoming a truth teller, going on that path. It is a... Uh, it is a mission. It's, it's something that you guys uh, and people like us, and I include myself in that, um, sort of set up ourselves up for uh, coming in on this incarnation. And um, so I wouldn't want to put it down. I, I do want to say, though, that in terms of your own experience, were you surveilled? And if so, how? Can you describe that? Well, See, there, in fact, lies the problem, because it's against the law for anybody to tell you. So in 2006, um, it is. Uh, I, it, my, my senator right now is Al Franken, and he is the uh, Senate Judiciary Subcommittee Chairman for Privacy, Technology, and the Law. Now, there aren't too many people that have more knowledge of, of um, domestic surveillance, specifically through... Uh, government contractors than I do. And what somebody like Ed Snowden, when, when he was talking about PRISM and, and Upstream, um, that was pretty much, you know, the discussion of the social media context um, where PRISM was involved with Microsoft and Yahoo and Google and Facebook and PayPal and YouTube and Skype and, and Hotmail and Apple. And, and, and um, Where I was involved and where I believe Teletech is involved. And again, I'm saying these things in public, and I've been saying them for years, and Teletech hasn't come back and sued me. So the fact that they're not able to come back and sue me when I say that Teletech Holdings is likely sharing private, confidential, proprietary customer information with third parties without the acknowledgement or consent of, of the customer. Uh, um, sue me. Let's get this out in the open. 
you know, uh, prove to me that that's not true. Now, their customers are like uh, Verizon. Let's say, how about uh, uh, Sprint and Nextel? Um, Morgan Stanley, Bank of America, Best Buy Corporation, m you know, massive major corporations. They're involved um, with uh, the financial industry. They're involved with the healthcare industry. And so what I would say is that based on my experiences with Teletech, based on my experience with the fact that Teletech is a corporation that uh, basically the business model was stealing from their customers, stealing from their employees, uh, lying and misleading their shareholders, and lying and misleading the SEC. Boy, okay. You know. Well, yeah, and that I understand that part of it. But uh, what I what I don't understand, or w what I'm hoping to hear, since um, if you just bear with me, Mark, I, I'm going to wait for this to show up, and and hope that we are going to be able to get back. Yes. Okay. We are now back online, so if um, go right ahead and and you do, re I assume you remember just refreshing your memory about the question in terms of what exactly about talking about uh, Ill what is domestic surveillance of the American people or uh, worldwide people uh, experiencing harassment, etc. Um, although we don't have a proof, uh, oftentimes there's no exact way to to prove this, but People are talking about it. I'm interviewing people about it. And uh, so your answer, go right ahead. Well, I'm going to answer with what was an op-ed from Senator Franken uh, recently in C on CNN. So there's an op-ed, and I'm going to paraphrase because I don't have it directly in front of me. But uh, he said uh, that if he told the American people what the NSA was doing, that he could be uh, 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 put under arrest and, and, and uh, would be a violation of, of federal charges. Okay, but that's, so, that's someone who actually knows what the NSA, I mean, the, the, the average person out there who's experiencing the other end of surveillance, and I'm assuming that these things happen to you, in other words, maybe, I don't know, clicks on your phone, hang-ups, these things that are happening tonight where we get disconnected because uh, they don't like what we're talking about or whatever. Um, this kind of thing, we can't, uh, we don't know, we can't prove what the NSA is doing. Are you saying that Franken is somebody who has at their disposal inside information? Oh, absolutely. And uh, they, both he and my congressman, Keith Ellison, who I started telling this uh, to in 2007, uh, Keith Ellison was just on uh, national television telling people that, Congress really wasn't aware of any of this when, in fact, I've been, you know, giving him all of this information um, since he came in the office in 2007. In 2006, I went to my then Senator Mark Dayton, who's now the governor of Minnesota, and I told him and described what was happening to me and what I thought was happening to me. And uh, I convinced his office to file a Freedom of Information Act request with the FBI. Uh, basically, I told them that. Um, it, it, you know, I am under the impression that um, I am on some type of a watch list and do not, work, you know, so there are do not fly lists, there are terrorist watch lists, there are do not work lists, there's the main core database. Um, and I told him that, you know, describe the situation that I work for a company that's a, gov you know, a government contractor affiliated with the Department of Homeland Security. Um, they sent a FOIA request to the FBI. Um, asking if, if my name was on a watch list or had been affiliated to putting on some type of a do not work list. And they, we got a FOIA response back from the FBI basically telling the senator that uh, it was against the law to disclose that information to him. And I said, well, boy, you know, wouldn't it have been easier for them to say that I wasn't on the end of a watch list or, or a harassment? And I said, uh, you know, does this not prove, in fact, that, you know, are you not assuming at this point that I, my name is potentially on a list because it would have been easier for them to say no. And he said, well, they, his senior staff, they said, well, yes, but there's nothing we can do. We can't go forward with this. So it's actually against the law uh, to find out if your name is on a list. Uh, these national security letters are, are held in secret. Um, and so there's okay, so no is, defense. Is, okay, I appreciate that. But is your answer, in essence, that uh, you have been surveilled, but you can't reveal how? Yes. 
it's against the law under the Patriot Act for them to disclose. It's against the law. But for um, you as a victim of, of this. Right. Um, recently, the um, I believe it was that the uh, CEO of Yahoo, um, boy, I wish I could remember her name. It'll come to me. It, uh, admitted basically the same thing, that um, – she would like to tell the American people what the NSA was doing, but if, if she told the NSA, or if she told the people what the NSA was doing, um, she would be arrested. Mark Zuckerberg uh, came out and said along the same things about how his business was being impacted because you know fewer and fewer people wanted to do business with um, with Facebook, um, and so that domestic surveillance was actually bad for their business. Yeah. And now we, we find out that um, there's an intelligence community directive that's called Intelligence Community Directive Number 204, and it's the National Intelligence Priorities Framework because, you know, President Obama, along with Senator Feinstein, apparently just admitted that they didn't know anything about spying on, on foreign press. But President Obama was the same person that came out and said, this isn't about spying on the American people. <laughs> and we know how that ended up. And one of the things that, I don't know if people remember this, but uh, 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 Senator Obama's privacy uh, was um, attacked when he was running for president, uh, when apparently somebody broke into the office of uh, uh, where they housed the U.S. passports. And um, his passport records were stolen. Uh, apparently along then with uh, John McCain and, and Hillary Clinton. And here's what he said then. He said, one of the things that the American people count on in their interactions with any level of government is that if they disclose information, uh, personal information, that it's going to stay personal and private. And when you have not just one, but a series of attempts to tap into people's personal records, that's a problem. Not just for me, but for how our government is functioning. So that was Senator Obama, President, you know, presidential candidate Obama, talking about what it's like to be on the receiving end of domestic surveillance. <laughs> Which indeed he was, uh, although he, he certainly had to be complicit in it from, from day one. And that goes back to his knowing that, that he was going to be president, if, if you follow that story. But, right, uh, and, and, and just like making a addendum to that story about a whistleblower. And one of the investigators was named Lieutenant Quarles Harris. And he was investigating um, the use and, and, and the purpose of the, uh, the, the theft of the uh, passport information, and he ended up getting shot to death. Right. Okay. Very interesting. Well, I mean, of course, that would be a whole uh, very interesting in investigation to start doing is in terms of domestic surveillance, uh, people that become aware of it, like yourself, on a, on a very um, upfront on personal basis, investigating what happens to them, uh, especially the ones that actually don't start whistleblowing because, uh, you know, but, but maybe leave their jobs uh, later explaining about it or, or whatever. Um, you know, I think there's some kind of gray area going on here because, again, people are doing it all over the Internet. Uh, what, where that loophole exists or if it even does exist um, you know, and, and what the difference is between like a CEO of a company such as Facebook, who it maybe doesn't have, is not a, at liberty to say how they're being surveilled by their own government. I mean, we're really talking about something that, that a place like Russia has been involved in doing as a matter of course. It's simply that the U.S. is now um, getting up to speed on all of that, apparently, and actually has been really for the last I would say a good 10 years, uh, probably much longer than 10 years. I remember even hearing that televisions, even before the digital you know, television and all that, were used to, to spy on people. In other words, the camera in a television can look into your, into your rooms and, and watch you and be used to, to watch you, etc. cetera. And um, we certainly know that that's going on now with our computers, people that don't cover their cameras, just for those listening. Um, are fools, <laughs> in my opinion, simply because the camera on the computer uh, can easily be accessed and, and be viewing whatever you're doing, uh, you know. Or even, even your smartphone. People don't have an idea that, that even when the smartphone is turned off, 
that it's listening. Now, yes. you know, we're talking about going to a retail store and, and giving up your thumbprint. We've got facial recognition systems. We've got trap wire. Uh, we've got uh, game systems that are, you know, voice activated. So you don't have to turn them off or turn them on. You just talk to your TV. Well, you know what? That means it's on 24-7, and it's connected to the Internet. Yes. So, you know, basically what you've invited into your house is, is a microphone and a camera that's on 24-7 that you can't turn off. I was on a, a radio program, and I had uh, somebody call in, and we were talking about these things. And he said that he was a computer repair person and that recently he's seen a lot of PCs and laptops coming in, and the cameras are locked into the on position, uh, even when the computer <laughs> turned off. And okay. what he did was... Um, he went and he found a virus, and then the virus was linked back to the FBI. Yeah, there you go. Okay. And he said that he was, he, it was, you know, and I said, well, wait a minute, you better be careful because it's against the law for you, to, you know. I, I, I asked him, I said, did you tell the, the people what the source of the virus was? He says, well, no, I can't do that. And so, you know, people walking around with a smartphone, you know, they put it in their pocket, um, and basically that's a, a you know, a, a GPS system and it, you know, it constantly monitors your, um, not only your, your location, but the content of your conversation. Now, it, it, I, I, like I said, I, I like to use a historical context in all of this. And so, you know, when we look back, you know, we can look back to things like the church commission and in 1976, uh, you know, it was the investigation of, of you know, basically uh, um, Watergate and, and overreaches of the government when it came to domestic surveillance. And this, this is what uh, uh, Senator Frank Church talked about in 1976. The National Security Agency's capability at any time could be turned around on the American people, and no one would have any privacy left, such as the capability to monitor everything, telephone conversations, Telegrams, it doesn't matter. There would be no place to hide. If a dictator ever took over the NSA, it could enable it to impose total tyranny, and there would be no way to fight back. Now, that was 1976 technology. Yes. Um, but I, I want to give you a quote here as well, and this is from a, a, a President Obama senior advisor. And, and tell me if you, you can... Uh, uh, Tell me if you, if you can try to tell me who said this. He said, at the same time, the huh. capacity to assert social and political control over the individual will vastly increase. As I have already noted, it will soon be possible to assert almost continuous surveillance over every citizen and to maintain up-to-date, complete files containing even most personal information about the health or personal behavior of the citizen in addition to more customary data. These files will be subject to instantaneous retrieval by the authority. <laughs> and he went okay. on to say, another threat, less overt but no less basic, confronts liberal democracy, more directly linked to the impact of technology. It involves the gradual appearance of a more controlled and directed society. Such a society would be dominated by an elite whose claim to political power would rest on allegedly superior scientific know-how, unhindered by the restraints of traditional liberal values. This elite would not hesitate to achieve its political ends by using the latest modern techniques for influencing public behavior and keeping society under close surveillance and control. Okay. You know, who's, you know who said that? Uh, uh, no, I don't, but it certainly sounds like Eisenhower uh, many, many years before. <laughs> Zbigniew Brzezinski. In 1968. Figures. Right. So he's in the puppet, he he's wrote the a puppet book. master, and, 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 you know, for all intents and purposes. Right. He wrote a book called Between Two Ages, America's Role in the Technetronic Era, and that was in 1970. The first reference I gave, you know, talking about having these files subject to instantaneous retrieval, having update complete files with even the most personal information, the health and the per personal behavior. Um, that was from a, a magazine uh, called Encounter in January of 1968. Okay, so... Incredible, yes. Je What's that? I said incredible, yes, we're there. You it, know, you know. Um, uh, so that, that was 1968. <laughs> oh, so, so, I mean, you know, we, we were... I don't even know if VCRs were around at that time. 
So imagine, you know, and, right. and if, if there were cell phones, it was the size of a briefcase, and we were listening to eight-track tapes. Right. Imagine what type of technology we have now. Now, he went on to say even more scary things um, than that. But again, you know, it would seem that if there's a Republican in, in the uh, executive office, if there's a Republican president, there seems to be Henry Kissinger uh, in the background. And if there's a Democrat president, it seems to be is a, is a big net for Shinsky. But those two quotes, I, you know, I gave you were from 1976 and 1968 to 1970. Right. Uh, I mean, I mean, there's no doubt whatsoever. And uh, Camelot has a, a numerous people talking about the level of surveillance and the capability. And Jake Simpson, one of our whistleblowers, is uh, um, someone who did, talks about it uh, probably in excess of, of where where we are even going at this point, really talking about um, being 10,000 years in advance. I mean, we're talking about the secret space program. We're talking about technology right. and, and, and abilities that are simply not in the in the public domain at all, or then they are not referred to either. Uh, in, even back then, we had a secret government uh, going on. So if, if we can, well, at this let, moment... Let me give you one more quote. If, if, if you're into that, this, is, this quote <laughs> also comes from Between Two Ages. Okay. And again, I mean, when you introduce people to this, and you know, this is a lot of information for people to try to process. And, um, you know, for, for, for most people, I mean, it, it, it's too much. But if what we're talking about, and, and I understand what you're talking about, but this is also a quote from the book Between Two Ages. Accurately timed, artificially excited electronic strokes could lead to a pattern of oscillations that produce relatively high power levels over certain regions of the Earth. One could develop a system that would seriously impair the brain performance of a very large population in selected regions over an extended period. Sure. Uh, you know, and, and, is, is he writing science fiction or is he writing <laughs> science fact? Exactly. Uh, and that well, should scare the hell out of people. Absolutely. Yeah, because, yeah, we used to make jokes, okay, Carrie, we used to make jokes about, you know, the KGB and show me your papers and we're, <laughs> you know, we're, we're wiretapping your phones. We used to make fun of the, of the Stasi and we used, the East Germans and we used to make fun of, you know, these, you know, now, I mean, we're carrying around a device in our pocket that is monitoring, you know, every single thing we do, every person we talk to, and that information is going to Bluffdale, Utah. And, you know, the, the, the biggest, uh, you know, data repository in the history of mankind. And sure. what are they using it for? You know, so people like us, Carrie, I think you'll agree. They listen to us all the time. Absolutely. I mean, I mean the conversations I have, because these cutoffs, these happen, you know, when I'm talking with Karen or when I'm talking with other senior high all the time. And there yeah, was but you know, I, I have to say that I get a kick out of television shows because I, you know, I watch from time to time some of the newer stuff that comes out just to see where they're going with things and what they're planting in there for people to, to be aware of because you need to really know your enemy well, uh, and and so I, I see them and even a recent show uh, called Betrayal that you have a guy who's working for a, a head of the Illuminati type. And he actually reaches behind a picture and pulls out, you know, one of those old fashioned kind of listening devices, you know, and smashes it with the hammer on the guy's desk. I mean, that is so old fashioned. You know, they have to lie to us. I mean, even in the television shows, then this is brand new. In other words, this is how well, stupid. Well, what you have to understand is, yeah, um, I'm hearing this, this odd sound. Are you, are you picking it up? Uh, not hello? a, Hello? Not Hello. at my end. Hi, are you there? Uh, okay. Carrie, hello? Yeah, can you hear me? I, I got you now. We're back. We're back. Okay, well, uh, so we had um, interference. We had interference right there. Uh, I think we're still live. I'm going to ask the people in the chat um, if... Uh, um, hold on one second. I'm just going to see what, what they've got to say. We do have a chat room here. Yes, uh, we're still live. Okay, great. All right. Um, so so you were about to say something, I think, be, before you kind of 
lost contact. Well, what, 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 what we have to know, so all of these TV shows, like, you know, Person of Interest or, yes. you know, all of these are PSYOPs, okay? Right. The same, this is media. My acronym for the word media is making everyone dumber in America. <laughs> um, and for the D, you can substitute dead or destitute because it's the same thing. Now, the same corporation that own 90% of our media, so what, five or six international corporations all typically affiliated to uh, military industrial complex, they also own the newspapers. Yes. And they own the, the, the production companies for, for you know, films. So, you know, when you see suddenly every movie is either uh, a, a zombie or a, a vampire or, you know, exactly. the other thing that I, I find interesting is that basic. Like, remember in the 70s when, the, you know, the commies were the bad guys, and then in the 80s it was the, you know, the Middle Eastern people were the bad guys? Now, you know, even in the comedy, you know, movies, like like the movie Red or, you know, um, you know these Bruce Willis movies, the bad guys are always the CIA. <laughs> and, I mean, it's true. I mean, yes. in the 70s it was the commies, it was... Russians, they were bad guys. In the 80s, it was the, the Middle Eastern people. And, and now, and basically, every movie that you know you, you go and watch, you know, a movie like The Expendables, a comic, I mean... It, well, it, I actually know. have a friend who says that a lot of the bad guys are also Englishmen, which is really interesting. There's like a subtle understanding that the English that the English are trying to run the world. Uh, and we've got, you know, of course, the Rothschild City of London and that whole nine yards. Um, so that's kind of an interesting twist on that story. But uh, what I'd like to ask you, because you did mention to me Promise Software, and I was wondering, what is it you think you know, or what is it do you know about Promise? Uh, because I've actually, I've, I've investigated that quite a bit. Okay. Well, before that, just quickly, there was a movie, I think it was from 2002 or 2003, called Enemy of the State. Oh, yeah. And do you, do you remember that movie? I love Will that Smith movie. And, yeah, excellent. And Gene Hackman. Yes. Okay. Now, why aren't the producers of this film in jail? Are they? I mean, no. No, but basically, if you look at this, <laughs> everything everything that, that Ed Snowden was talking about is in here. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Now, if you look closely, um, and, and when I... When I saw, Oh, this it blew me away. The you, you know the uh, the group of CIA um, or NSA, you know, uh, um, the people that are conducting the surveillance. Um, the company that they use as a cover is called Teletech. <laughs> now it, I don't think that that's a coincidence. Yeah. But you know, so um, you know, people can go watch the movie Enemy of the State. There's also a book, and it was published in 2005, and it's called No Place to Hide. And I recommend it. It's written by Robert O'Hara, who wrote for the Washington Post. All right. Very and the, good. The title of the book is, this is the total title of the book. You are being watched. Government agencies and private corporations know where you live, how much you earn, what you buy, and sometimes <laughs> even what you read. And increasingly, this information is being leaked or sold to identity thieves. In a surveillance society out of control, there is no place to hide. So that's, you know, so why isn't this guy in jail? You know, Excellent. he's basically disclosing the same thing that, you know, Ed Snowden was talking about, but he was talking about it in 2005. So, you know, the types of things that Ed Snowden disclosed were the types of things that, you know, people like Russell Tice and, and William Benny and Tom Mr. Ray and Mark Klein from AT&T. Now, you're talking about Russell Tice and William Biddy and Thomas. You know, those were actual senior employees of the NSA. Um, and, and, you know, somebody like Chris Pina. But if, if somebody's going to tell me, well, wait a minute, you know, we didn't know about, you know, this spying. Now, if anything happens to me, it wasn't an accident, okay? <laughs> I just want to say that. Yeah, and I, 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 I second because the notion, absolutely. If you've done an investigation into Promise, you know that there's about 40 people that are dead that are affiliated with this, including Danny Casalero, yes. who was the journalist. Okay, but if, if you look at it in actuality, um, a number of lawyers, a number of investigators, a number, a number of CIA employees, a number of witnesses, um, and I'll give you their name. But basically, and again, what I'm telling you now is not 
top secret or above top secret. So I'm I'm telling you information that is in the congressional record, in the federal court record. Yes. Uh, is in the uh, public uh, access record. So that I'm not telling you anything that isn't available to anybody that has access to the internet. So well, if somebody wants. It's also in a book by uh, Sherry to Seymour. Search the word main core database. You're going to find some information. Now you know what? That's going to put a red flag next to your name. Um, yes. But you know, let's <clears throat> let's let's give them something to do with their time. <laughs> but um, I sent you an article from Wired Magazine. Yes. And Wired is a, uh, a trade journal for information technology. <clears throat> and uh, the article was called The Inslaw Octopus. And what this talks about is a software program that was developed uh, through a government grant, through a private company, called Promise. And Promise stands for the uh, Prosecutor's Case Management System. And um, what it ended up being was a very sophisticated way to track people through computer databases. And where Promise was able to actually turn the key and turn the whole form of intelligence collection on its head was that um, Promise could turn blind data into information. So promise actually was, in a way, artificial intelligence. Yep. And um, again, if, if people would read this article, and maybe you could put a link to the article on your website. Okay, no problem. So people can look for this. Right. Uh, for them to read this, because this is the screenplay for what would have been a great movie. <laughs> um, yes. And so... Um, this individual named Bill Hamilton had his company called Inslaw, and he developed this system uh, called Promise, which was developed for attorneys uh, as a case management software system that would allow uh, lawyers to track individual people throughout the legal system. But then the Justice Department saw it and said, huh, that's kind of cool. Um, that would, you know, make a, a neat tool. And so they essentially turned Promise into Google for spies. Um, and so what it, you know, what it was allowed to do or, or, or what it did was uh, using Promise as a way of tracking people. Um, and the real power of Promise was that it could associate itself to disparate databases. And so... It became kind of a Google. Okay. For, yeah. Go right ahead. Go right ahead. Yeah. It became kind of a Google for spying. And Promise had the capacity to turn this blind data into information, and became a real powerful tracking system or device uh, for intelligence operations. And so, you know, if you were able to put somebody's name into the system with, you know, under Promise. Uh, you know, it would pick up your movements and, uh, you know, uh, bank accounts or, or stock market or uh, your portfolio or traffic tickets or social security number. And um, when the Department of Justice figured out that, you know, this was really uh, significant, um, that's when Bill Hamilton uh, tried to take it to the next level. And he upgraded some enhancements, uh, basically on his own, and uh, allowed the Justice Department to take a look at it. And uh, so, with the enhancements, he cut a deal with the government, saying that the enhancements weren't part of the original uh, government funding that helped create the initial version of Promise. And so, there was two. There was, you know, the initial Promise, and let's take call it Promise 2.0. And so Promise 2.0 uh, became what everybody wanted. And uh, if you read this article, um, the Department of Justice established a protocol for taking out uh, Bill Hamilton and his law. And through deceit, through deception, through trickery, and, uh, you know, they ended up being able to do that. They had a uh, the Department of Justice, not 
them call it, you know, very little justice to be found in the Department of Justice, <laughs> uh, had a, a type of a premeditated plan to destroy Bill Hamilton and his lab and, and steal this technology. Sure. Uh, and, it, you know, so if you look back, it, it was linked to things like Aberrant Contra. It was linked back to things like Oliver North. Um, it was given to um, uh, other governments. That's right. Uh, apparently, it was installed with a back door. Um, and when Bill Hamilton decided that he was going to try to uh, uh, mount a, uh, a legal defense, against the theft of his company and his technology. Um, he went up against the, the legal system and the justice system um, that uh, uh, completely uh, found in favor of the government. Um, he went to a bankruptcy court, and the bankruptcy judge actually ruled in his interest, and that ended up getting overturned. Then the IRS got involved, um, and then the initial uh, bankruptcy judge was replaced um, the lawyer for the IRS replaced him, uh, you know, but uh, this became uh, a huge problem. And, and uh, the House Judiciary Committee looked into it. The chair, Jack Brooks, looked into it and basically reported that high government officials were involved. Several individuals testified under oath that Insula's promise software was stolen and distributed internationally in order to provide financial gain and to further intelligence and foreign policy objectives. Again, <laughs> I'm not telling you anything that isn't, that is top secret. This That's is right. in the public domain. Okay, okay but, but let me ask you, Mark, because you seem to have a great um, sort of grasp of the story, uh, and I don't know if you read The Last Circle by Sherry Seymour. I, I, I did, but it was a, a while back. Okay, the reason no I looked into promise, Terry, yes. was I was trying to build my own case. So I took this, I took all of this information that I'm reading you. I took this to Congress. And I, you know, I was building the case to say, you know, these weapons are being used against American citizens uh, by the American government. And, you know, so I, I'm a person in no way, shape, or form associated in any way to terrorism, except for being on the receiving end of it. Now, it's against, the, it's against the law for me to prove it. I'm incapable of proving it, and it's against the law for, apparently, my Congress people to prove it. So, um, you know, other than that, you know, what are we to do? And so, Well, I would yeah, think that's the good question. I mean, no, I mean, you're working with Karen Hudis, and let's bring this back home here for a moment and ask you, uh, and I don't know what part of the country you're in or, or anything, whether you're in Washington, D.C., the way she is, uh, or at least near there, but, um, you know, in other words, the rule of law is something that they establish for their own purposes, and then they do whatever they want behind the scenes when it suits their purposes. Um, but I don't know what your recourse is or going to be. In other words, are you working with Karen in hopes of doing something uh, about this? You're certainly hitting the airwaves now. You're getting uh, some some notice. But um, where is it going for you? What, what do you suggest even for yourself? Well, first let me tell you this. Um, I went to I, – I did everything that a whistleblower is supposed to do. So even when I was at Teletech, what I did is I went up the chain of command and I went to the senior executives and I went to the I went to the, I went to the CEO, and I told them that what we're doing is not sustainable, and you know eventually um, the uh, Teletech and lost the subsidiary Nugen, and the shareholders uh, lost by my uh, estimation it plus or minus in the realm of two hundred fifty million dollars. Um, in San Diego, where Nugen was headquartered. Um, you, you know, hundreds, you know, I, I'm thinking perhaps as many as 800, 900 jobs were lost. Um, and this was all preventable. And again, um, Teletech is, has a, um, a Yahoo financial message board page. And um, anybody can go to, just go to Yahoo financial message board. Uh, the stock ticker is TTEC. Um, I am FPVSFF. It's an inside joke between myself and the CEO, chairman of the board, Ken Tuckman of Teletech Holdings. It stands for fire prevention versus fire fighting. Because I tried to convince them that it was cheaper to, to prevent fires than to constantly put them out or try to put them out. Um, um, well, when you say that, I mean, what were you you trying to 
get them to do. I mean, it sounds like, at least to me on the outside, that they were in very deep. They weren't about to try to prevent anything. Hello? Hello. <laughs> I, I hear I hear something like a like a cymbal gong or something. I keep hearing the sound. Wow! Are you picking that up on your end? No. No, I'm hearing this. It's like an ex, it's like an electronic explosion. It's wow! Like a, it's so like every, a, every time I ask a, a good question, the gong goes off. No, just joking. <laughs> so there it was again. Okay, one moment. And hello. Okay, everyone, uh, I'm hoping that we're coming live again. Are we live? Okay, it looks like we've gone live. Okay, sorry for that. Uh, there was a, as you said, there was some kind of gong that you heard at your end every time I spoke, and uh, it seemed to 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 want to take us down. So here we are again. Um, what we're going to do, and we've been going for an hour and a half. Uh, I'm going to take a, about a half hour worth of questions from the uh, listeners, and they can type their, their questions into the chat. They may, there may be some there. I will try to go through there and see if I can find them. Um, and, and, you know, so bear with me when I do that. But, but basically, uh, Mark, we were talking, we sort of, if you want to wrap this whole thing up, you were going to use some of the, uh, the, the sort of, I don't know, the storyline or, 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 or some tips with, that you were finding within the Promise Software saga to, to basically mount your own defense. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, you know, to me, uh, the, you know, the information that I was providing to Congress about all of this, um, now, you know, proves that what I'm saying is true and that, that uh, you know, these, these weapons are being used against the American people. Now, in March, I just want to read this quickly before we go to questions. In March of 2011, now, again, this, my congressman is Keith Ellison. And he, in association with about 20 other congressmen, wrote a letter to the chairman of the Committee uh, to, uh, Congressional Oversight and, uh, and Government Reform Committee, the Judiciary Committee, the uh, House Intelligence Committee, and the Armed Services Committee. And this was in response to three, and I'm reading directly from the, uh, the writ of the uh, group of Congress people. There's uh, a Federal Defense and Intelligence Agency data security contractors in a leading law firm planned a dirty tricks campaign that included possible illegal actions against citizens engaged in free speech. It went on to name the companies uh, being Defense Data Security Contractors, HB Gary Federal, Palantir Technologies, Barico Technologies, uh, listed as Team Themis and the law firm of Hunt and Williams. And what they said in this letter was that the possibility that any one of these crimes was committed warrants investigation. It's deeply troubling to think that tactics developed for use against terrorists may have been unleashed against American citizens. And then ask the question, did the government contractors violate federal laws? Are there adequate laws in place to protect American citizens from intrusive and or unethical uh, electronic surveillance tactics? Were government resources inappropriately used to target American citizens? All of these things happened to me. And I, and I was telling uh, Congressman Ellison and Senator Franken about them in 2007. And, you know, by, by, by no coincidence. So what I was using, I was using um, Operation Chaos from 1968. The CIA, with assistance from numerous government agencies, conducted a massive illegal domestic covert operation called Operation Chaos, the, most large, the largest and most pervasive domestic surveillance program in the history of the country. That was 1968. So what I'm telling them is that I'm getting... That prima facie evidence, as, as, as much as I can prove, that I'm on the, the receiving end of illegal government domestic surveillance, and, and I'm just a citizen. And I'm, I'm assuming or presuming that others are being targeted. And the people that are being targeted are other whistleblowers. The people that are being targeted are journalists, are, are lawyers defending whistleblowers, are government employees that are trying to forewarn of crises. Um, and so, you know, by... by Showing the case, you know, proving them and sitting down with their senior staffers and showing them the information about promise, talking about the church committee. And I've implored both, both of them and, and all members of Congress that what we need is another church committee. We need to really get to the bottom of this. Instead, President Obama wants to put, you know, apart Cass Sunstein, who wanted to ban conspiracy theorizing um, as, as part of <laughs> 
I mean, it, it, it's, you know, absolutely ridiculous. And there was also a Brookings Institute study that, that you know, talked about these things that maybe if we can get uh, some time uh, in addition to the questions we can go into. But that's what I did. So I went to Congress not just with my problems, but with solutions. And I told them it started in 2007 and 2009. You've got contractors out there that are, you know, attacking the private citizens, and we need to investigate this. So in 2011, they put this letter together and said, you know, if, the, if these tactics are being used against American citizens, we need to get to the bottom of this. And I told them, I told Keith Ellison exactly, this is exactly what I told you has been happening to me. And I can prove it if you help me. But then Senator Franken ends up saying, you know, a, a, a month ago, that um, there's, uh, you know, in fact, if he told the, the – uh, American people, what the NSA was really doing, that he, as a senator, could get thrown in jail. That's okay. Uh, yeah. And, 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 okay. And that's, this is unbelievable. Uh, so crazy. Um, so we, we, we do have at least, uh, well, one question here. And uh, you said you wanted to, to get into um, uh, the, the, some kind of Project Blue Book, uh, and, and you're welcome to do that. Um, I will ask you, I don't see a lot of questions here at the moment. Uh, Looks like we even have some kind of hacker in in our <laughs> in in the in the chat, which is a, a first. But at any rate, um, or a spammer, however you look at that. Uh, anyway, well, I'm associated with a lot of people's first when it comes to talking about this. Okay, uh, how can we get the status quo to care about this? Uh, and tweet links. Um, how do we get them to care? Uh, you know. I, I, I guess we're, you're doing it, um, in essence, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, you are doing radio shows, uh, this, this show with Camelot, and I've seen you on Russia Today uh, and, and other YouTube videos. I know you, did, you were in Mike Harris's radio show a few times. Um, wh what would you suggest based on well, that let question? Let me top all of that, okay? I went to Gretchen Morgens from the New York Times years ago, Pulitzer Prize winner. I went to... Uh, the Washington Post with Dana Priest, she ended up writing a, a series called Top Secret America. And I gave her a lot of information associated with what she wrote about Top Secret America, and I think she won an award for that. I went to Marcy Gordon at AP. I went to Jonathan Weil at Bloomberg. Um, what happens is there's another list out there. It's called the No Publish List. Now, I went and I was, you know, had, had lengthy, numerous conversations with 60 Minutes, uh, senior executive producer Bob Anderson. And we got into details with this five or six years ago. So what, what have, you know, completely negated the need for anybody like, like Ed Snowden to, to do what he had done. And um, after these, you know, communications, I, I, I sent, you know, Bob uh, information that corroborated everything I, I said. But he ended up, you know, you know, I thought it was a go. I thought we were greenlighting. And he called me up and said, Mark, we're going to spike the story. Uh, it's just too complicated for 60 minutes. How can this – he says, well, we wouldn't be able to fit this into a 60-minute segment. Um, and so uh, I did get a call back from a, from a journalist that uh, won a Pulitzer. And actually she – called me up and she said, Mark, I, um, listen, I apologize. My editor's pulling the story. There's nothing I can do. Good luck. It hung up on me. Wow. So um, the mainstream media is unwilling. You know, so you have somebody like Amber Lyon for CNN that wanted to tell the truth. She got fired. Okay. Um, yeah. Anybody in, you know, so uh, the the journalists, well, I don't, we don't have journalists. We have reporters. Okay. Uh, you know, we've got, you know, some people like, uh, uh Chris Hedges out there that, that are actually journalists. And, and, you know, there, there's some, but, well, we have our reporters. And, right. You know, when I tell people, you know what, CNN doesn't even have an investigative uh, journalism division anymore. <laughs> yeah, no, you know I, I, believe, no, I believe it. Absolutely. They, uh, they fired uh, Amber Lyon, uh, who did an investigation into atrocities committed uh, in Bahrain. And uh, seeing that Bahrain was a friend of the United States government, they didn't want to produce it. Um, and so Amber Lyon ended up getting fired. And uh, now CNN outsources all their investigative journalism. Incredible. So 
CNN, the world's supposed leader in journalism, doesn't have an investigative journalist part. In fact, John Stewart and The Daily Show did a story on it. It's hilarious. So go to YouTube and, and look at the story about CNN outsourcing their investigative journalism. <laughs> no, I'd like to. I'd like to read I just that. want to read. Pardon me? I, w I would like to read that. Go, go right ahead. Yeah. Um, what I'd like to read. Now, again, the people, we the people, you know, Diane Feinstein represents this. Al, Al Franken, he represents us. Keith Ellison, we don't have representatives. We have, you know, two people from two parties, the stupid party and the evil party, and they change sides. You know, we end up with the same thing. But um, we don't have the people. We don't have media protecting us. We don't have, you know, if, if a journalist wants to tell the, somebody the truth, they end up fired, and, and they're not able to 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 get a job. Right. They're blacklisted. Um, so they know what the score. And what they do is they fire somebody like Amber Lyons, and that sends a message across the bow to everybody else to get with the program. Okay, yeah. we're going to do the story about the, the kicking up the tree. Um, the people don't have think tanks. We don't have lobbyists. Uh, my Senator Paul Wellstone was murdered 11 years ago uh, last Friday, October 25th. Okay, right. uh, he w he was a person of, and and we did a, uh, a memorial on. on honor tribute last year to him uh, at the Wellstone Center, uh, recognizes the 10th anniversary of his death, uh, his assassination, um, his, the death of his wife, his daughter, uh, three staffers, and the, and the two pilots. And Incredible. nobody would cover that. Wow. Um, you know, that was a joke. Everybody who had everything to gain by his death were wow. the ones that investigated it. And I'm talking about the FBI, the National Transportation Safety Board, and George Bush and That the uh, um, that the news media was telling us, and the eyewitnesses' accounts were contrary to everything the the FBI. Now, what happened was uh, the NTSB and the FBI failed to hold a public hearing on the death of one of the most significant senators. Um, they, they said that uh, that he wasn't high profile enough to warrant a public hearing. <laughs> yeah. Now, what I would recommend to your listeners is to go to the website www.wellstonetheykilledhim.com and take a look at a documentary film that backs up everything I've said. Now, one of the things, www.wellstonetheykilledhim.com. Um, now, one of the things Paul Wellstone said was, we all do better when we all do better. Um, I'd like to modify that. Uh, we all do better... And this is the type of information that I shared with Congress and that I shared with the media that they were afraid to write. And this is a 2011 report from December 14th from the Brookings Institute for Technology and Innovation. And the title of the report is Recording Everything, Digital Storage as an Enabler of Authoritarian Government. And I just want to read to your audience the conclusion segment. And it says, the ability to record everything will tilt the playing field back in favor of repressive governments by laying the foundation for a plethora of new approaches to targeting dissent. When all the telephone calls in an entire country can be captured and provided to voice recognition software program to extract key phrases, when video footage from public spaces can be correlated in real time to the conversations, text messages, and social media traffic associated with people, occupying those spaces, the arsenal of responses available to a, regi a regime facing dissent will expand. This will provide the greater capability to shape or quell dissent. Declining storage costs will soon make it practical for authoritarian governments to create permanent digital archives of the data gathered from pervasive surveillance systems. In countries where it, there is no meaningful public debate on privacy, there are There's no reason to expect governments not to fully exploit the ability to build databases containing every phone conversation, location data for almost every person and vehicle, and video from every public space in an entire country. This will greatly expand the ability of repressive regimes to perform surveillance of opponents and to anticipate and react to unrest. In addition, the awareness among the populace of pervasive surveillance will reduce 
the willingness of people to engage in dissent. The coming era of ubiquitous surveillance in an authoritarian country has important implications for American foreign policy. Strategies for engaging with these countries will benefit from specific consideration of the presence, growth, and increasing impact of these enormous digital databases. This will impact human rights, trade, export control, intellectual property security, and the operation of multinational businesses with in-country facilities, subsidiaries, and contractors. Finally, the use by authoritarian governments of systems that record everything that in complete absence of privacy considerations will lead to a long list of other unforeseen and generally negative consequences. Unfortunately, the residents of those countries, as well as the rest of us, will soon start to find out just what those consequences are. Absolutely. Uh, all right. Well, that was from the Brookings Institute, right? Yeah. And, and, okay. So what they're warning us is how this information is going to be used to suppress and quell dissent and to find <laughs> out, you know, and uncover truth. So, you know, I would suggest that Congress start with the Brookings Institute study from December 24, 2011, called Recording Everything, Digital Storage as an Enabler of Authoritarian Government. Yeah, uh, okay, and, 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 and well said. But at the moment, uh, we've got a, a, several questions, so I'd like to be able to go to those questions and... Then sure. we could perhaps circle back uh, to, to to talking, uh, it, just asking you a few last minute questions. Uh, okay, so we've got somebody here who is asking, um, and I'm, I'm trying to find. Uh, would you go to somebody like Glenn Greenwald? Um, and, and you know, I tried that. Okay. Um, you know, so at the time, I believe that I tried to contact Glenn Greenwald. And I contract. I contacted other uh, um, investigative journalists, and what they told me was this: that they uh, were fascinated and, and intrigued by my story. It, you know, again, the mainstream journalists said they couldn't believe what I was telling them and what I what I was able to demonstrate and prove to them. Um, but even the investigative journalists said, uh, "I'm not going to be able to sell this," and so you know, this is going to take two or three months of work. Um, and, um, you know, I'm not going to be able to sell it. Now, somebody like Matthew Rothschild from the Progressive Magazine wrote a very interesting article not too long ago about how the government was using uh, surveillance to spy on Occupy activists. So here's, you know, the Progressive Magazine out there, and I contacted Matt Rothschild, and I told him about my story, but there's only so much truth that they're allowed to leak out. And so I did, you know, I, I did everything I was supposed to do. I went to the legal community. They said, you know, this is a massive undertaking, and, and you know, there's nothing we can do. These people are protected by the Patriot Act. They're being protected by the government, and the, right, protected by the fact that they have billions of dollars, and they'll just outspend you. Right. So, okay. Uh, but, but unless you have two hundred fifty thousand. Okay. Uh, I I appreciate that. Uh, can you hear me? Because we seem to be breaking up. Hello. Hi. Can you hear me? I can hear you now. Okay. Hello. Uh, okay. Okay. I think we're still live, and and I'm I'm gonna hope the chat will give us feedback if if we do go off the air as quickly as possible. But um, what I wanted to know just there you go. Are you there? You're you're breaking up. Okay. Hello. Are. Because your story came out before Snowden, several years before Snowden, are you hearing me? I, I can hear you. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um. And and are we live? I'm I'm asking the chat to please respond uh, so I can be sure that we're live because I can't really tell. You're gone. Uh, you're 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 breaking up. You're. Okay. Um. Okay, hold on one second because I'm not getting an answer. Um, hold on one second here. Sorry. That's okay. Okay, somebody's feeding back. I'm, I'm sorry for the delay here. Can you hear me again, Mark? Hello? Mark? Hello? Hi, Mark, are you there? Can you hear me? Carrie. Carrie. Yeah, yes. 
Okay, I can hear you. Okay, uh, and and at this moment, uh, let me say that I don't have the chat up. I'm 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 actually having some issues. Um, I don't know what the problem is, so I have to close down a couple things here to make sure. I just heard the gong, and you're gone. We're gone. Hello. Can you hear me? Hello? I can. I can hear you fine. Okay, you're you're breaking up. I, I I get about every third word. Okay, hold on one second. I'm going to stop this and start it again. Hold on. Okay. Up again. Okay. We are back. I'm being told. Okay, great. So at this moment, what I wanted to say was, uh, the, uh, I actually forgot my question. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. It just It's getting a little bit confusing here, being interrupted so many times. Um, there, we were trying to, you were actually responding to the question that was in the chat, if I recall. Um, and then, then we did kind of go off. Yeah. They It was, it, yeah, I, I, I did try to contact Glenn Greenwell. I, I, I've spoken to mainstream. I, I've spoken to my local uh, journalists. Um, okay, but Greenwell... Uh, uh, I actually, in, in association with this as well... You weren't allowed... I, I never you heard back from Glenn Greenwell. I never right. got any response. Okay, fine. Uh, and and, and I, I am curious what you, what if you know anything about the death of Michael Hastings. Well, um, he was somebody that I was um, in the process of, of contacting. And um, the death of Michael Hastings is highly suspect. Uh, I don't think that we've been given the answers to what happened. And I think that it's, uh, you know, I, I, I think it's deplorable that um, the mainstream media and the news service would allow one of their best and brightest to die in such a fashion and have it be completely ignored by the mainstream media. Um, and their failure to protect one of their own shows, uh, a level of cowardice and incompetence that, you know, to me. Now, again, w when you deal with somebody in government, service like a congressperson. They put their hand on the Bible, and, and in the military, they take an oath to God to protect the rights of the defenseless and the press, uh, oppress and protect the Constitution from enemies foreign and domestic, so help them God. Uh, journalists and reporters don't take an oath to God to do their job, but when you see one of your own and one of the best of the brightest, you know, taken out in such a fashion, or a guy like Gary Webb, um, who was... Yes. An award-winning journalist wrote about Iran Contra. Uh, he ended up dying a very suspicious death. Um, a guy like um, Danny Casalero that was writing on its law, uh, Octopus. Yes. A guy like uh, Aaron Swartz, um, who, it, in fact, you know, upon news that the uh, a case against him was being dropped um, by MIT, um, and you know that that uh, this uh, malicious attack against him was falling apart. Uh, committing suicide didn't seem like it would be the appropriate <laughs> response. In fact, you know, it would have been a cause for celebration. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, you know what? Do people commit suicide? Yes, but they don't shoot themselves in the back of the head twice. Uh, That's right. You know, they don't, right before, like Danny Casalero, uh, you know, how about Michael Hastings? Did, you know, did... People, were people aware of the email he sent out the day of his death, you know, saying that he was under investigation and that the heat was on, that he needed to go underneath the radar, um, you know, and then die a suspicious death with, you know, circumstances that are still inexplicable. But, uh, you know, uh, the attention span of the average American is the equivalent of a third grader eating Captain Crunch, drinking Red Bull and watching cartoons. Um, and that's got to stop. Yes, absolutely. Uh, well, I'm with you there, and I've done some investigation on the death uh, of Michael Hastings. In order to do that, too, you know, again. Hello? Hi. Uh, I guess we've done, we've got a, a slight delay here, as well as a difficulty in with it being interrupted. Can you hear me? I can hear you now. 
Okay, well, I was just saying that the death of my, Michael Hastings, I have been investigating it, uh, highly suspicious, no doubt about it, uh, as well as all of those other journalists, um, which is appalling. And then, you know, you get into to other areas where people are being knocked off right and left for various, very suspicious circumstances uh, and framed also. Um, but, but going down this road, uh, when you're helping, uh, because we haven't really talked about anything you're doing with Karen Hudis. Can you can you talk a little bit about what you're doing uh, with her? And well, I, where... I, 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 right. Well, when I was first contacted by Karen about a year ago, uh, I was highly suspect um, because here was somebody from the World Bank who, you know, I knew to be a completely corrupt organization. Um, and why would this person be contacting me? And um, the first thing somebody like us had to figure out is when these people contact us, who they really work for and what their, what their true motivation is. Now, personally, I don't have a computer in my home anymore. I had three that were, were destroyed uh, through viruses, but my bigger concern was that somebody was going to reverse download some, some very awful pictures on my uh, hard drive and the FBI was going to kick in my door. Uh, I was going to be thrown in jail and uh, two days later get killed. Because, you know, I was a suspected pedophile. Those things happened. Um, I could read the list of the deaths associated to uh, Promise. And so, you know, people ridicule Ed Snowden for going to Hong Kong uh, to release this information. But what he did was he looked at Michael Hastings. He looked at Aaron Swartz. He looked at William Biddy. He looked at Thomas Drake. He looked at the way whistleblowers were treated. Um, and, you know, he thought that, it, you know, Uh, he looked at Bradley Manning. Bradley Manning wasn't in any way, shape, or form associated with war crimes. He was just, you know, making them well known. If you're in the military, you live by a thing called the Universal Code of Military Justice. It's against a law for you to take uh, and fulfill a, an illegal order. Um, and so, uh, you know, the, the people that committed atrocities uh, were free and clear. The, the guy who ended up reporting them got thrown in jail, essentially. No doubt about it for 30 years of the rest of his life. Right. Um, and we don't have a recourse. We don't have a legal system that protects whistleblowers. We don't have, uh, you know, government officials that respect him. And, and, you know, and in fact, under the Obama administration, we, you know, we're told all these, you know, happy thoughts after the, you know, the extreme debacle of the Bush-Cheney administration. And we had these high expectations. But then we saw the same hacks coming back like Kim Geithner and Robert Rubin and Larry Summers and Mary Shapiro and, and just, especially uh, Eric Holder. If anybody wanted to look into the background of Eric Holder, uh, you know, hell, even Bush prosecuted a couple of bankers. Um, and here, you know, this was a guy that is more interested in, in defending bankers. We've got banks like uh, uh, Standard Chartered, like um, UBS, like uh, 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 J.P. Morgan, that are laundering money for foreign terrorist organizations and drug cartels and walk away with a slap on the wrist. Um, you know, they're not allowing us to have a, a free and open discussion on information that with, that's within the congressional record, that's in the uh, federal court record, that's within the public record tonight. What's the problem with that? Um, I'm directing people to information that they can find on their own so that they can make an informed decision. Um, I'm talking about congressmen that need to go to jail uh, for misprison of felony. In misprison of treason. When you alert a congressperson or government official of a federal crime taking place and they fail to take action, that in itself is a federal crime. What about our, you know, what about our civil rights protections? What about the Fourth Amendment right to privacy in our own house? You know, how do we have that? What, you know, what about the conspiracy against our civil rights? Yes. What about the deprivation of rights under the color of law? What about federally protected activities? Most people don't. Why? You know, we had hearings from the 9-11 Commission. Okay, let's talk to the 9-11 commissioners. Let's talk to the chairman. They said we were set up to fail. Um, the only people that testified under oath of the 9-11 Commission were Senator Bob Graham, who was head of the Senate Intelligence Committee at the time, and Senator Bob Kerry, who said that Saudi Arabia was involved with this. Well, other than the fact that 19 of the hijacked. were Saudi nationals. 
Um, we had an investigation called the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission, headed by Chairman uh, Philip Angelides. Um, so, at, you know, we wanted to get to the end of the, uh, the bottom of the financial crisis. Now, I am also a financial securities whistleblower, and I blew the whistle in 2007 and 2009 about a hotline that existed between the SEC and CEOs to stop or stall investigations that was proven to be in existence in the uh, House Financial Services Committee uh, uh, made up investigations, yet nothing has been done. So in addition to being a domestic surveillance whistleblower, I was also a, a financial securities whistleblower. Now, um, how I got in contact with Karen Hudis was uh, through somebody she was working for in the United Kingdom that was familiar and had seen the information I was providing on the blog. Um, I called Karen, just out of curiosity, to find out why this person from the World Bank would, would uh, you know, try to uh, align forces with me. And uh, through the process of elimination, I determined that she, in fact, was the real deal, in that she was a, a very uh, uh, honest and, and uh, uh, informed, educated uh, whistleblower. Now, we share, uh, uh, you know, whistleblowers share a psychographic profile, um, you know, um, we're dedicated to justice, and we don't do this, you know, for fun or for profit. Uh, this, is the, <laughs> this would be the last thing I would right. recommend to anybody. Yes. But somebody's got to do it. And, you know, so we're people that don't have a respect for the natural law of fear. Um, and But so Karen and I are in contact almost pretty much on a daily basis. Okay, well, with that in mind, let me ask you if if you have any thoughts about uh, uh, the Chinese or uh, the UN coming in to uh, take over the the, uh, the United States. Okay. Well, I, I think what's happening, and I called this, you know, uh, years ago, uh, because the way we were going was unsustainable, and. Um, the ability for a government or a country to hold the international reserve currency status or fiat currency has always been uh, temporary, and they go through peculiar cycles. And, you know, we're going to what I call a process of de-Americanization. And you were very astute earlier to say that um, Ed Snowden, I, I think Ed Snowden was, you know, noble. And courageous and had all the right intentions. I think he, that he's being controlled and manipulated. Yes. What people don't know is that the leaks of Ed Snowden came from the Guardian in, in the UK. Now, I believe he also attempted to contact the Washington Post, and they turned him down. And he went to the Guardian. What people don't know is the Guardian is actually owned by the Scott Trust, and is affiliated with uh, uh, the Scott Trust is is run by the Rothschild family. Correct. I don't know if you were aware of that. Uh, well, okay. yes. So, uh, but but right, but do you know? Child. Okay, go ahead. But I I, I want to talk, follow this uh, ba uh, down. So continue. Okay. So what I'm thinking is is that uh, what's going on now with um, Ed Snowden is that uh, his information is being controlled and manipulated. Uh, in association to this de-Americanization process. So right now we're in the process of all of our allies turning against us. Uh, you know, because when you've got a, a program or a product like Promise, okay, that allows you to do a lot of things. It allows you to manipulate this, the stock market. It allows you to engage in money laundering and extortion. And again, I mean, if we could talk back, you know, we can go back to the Bank of Credit Commerce International. That's another one we could talk about maybe at a later date. But um, if the Department of Justice and the CIA and the NSA has the opportunity to monitor stock trading and financial transactions in real time, um, why is it that we haven't been able to prevent any of these financial crises? And what a tool and weapon, you know, for front-running uh, stock trades or, or, or having inside information um, would be having, you know, access to uh, the sophisticated spy software. Um, so, right. you know, what I'm saying okay. is this, is, is that, yeah, hello? Go ahead. Uh, 
Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, and I'm going to tie in domestic surveillance in the Fed, because in uh, uh, September of 2011, the Federal Reserve, which is neither federal nor has a reserve, uh, <laughs> put out a request for a proposal. And what this art, it's called an RFP. And uh, what they put out was uh, uh, looking for vendors to establish a social listening platform. To monitor billions of conversations and generate text analytics based on predefined criteria. Uh, the capability to determine the sentiment of the speaker or writer with respect to the some topic or document. Um, get, gather data from primary social media platforms, um, Facebook, Twitter, blogs, forums, YouTube, to collect aggregate data from various media outlets such as CNN and the nations and identify and reach out to key bloggers and influencers. So what the Fed did with this RFP was they acknowledged the fact that these companies had the ability to monitor billions of conversations predicated on text analytics and predefined criteria. What that means is that they're looking for keywords and phrases, which means they're reading what you're saying. In billions of conversations. And they're talking about how to handle crisis situations and that they would continuously monitor these conversations and identify and reach out to key bloggers and influencers. What does that mean to identify and reach out to key bloggers and influencers? Is that somebody that has an alternate opinion to what they're hearing from the government? Um, is this a way for the Fed to go after people that are being critical of the Fed? It is. Um, so what we can do is try to find people that are like-minded and, and uh, uh, you know, with Karen and myself, um, uh, you know, after I, I clear, now, now Karen had a high level of intelligence and a high level of understanding, but there were places that I was able to, to take her to that, uh, you know, she was unaware of, and, you know, and now she's just become, uh, you know, a mo You know, people, you know, we don't have a recourse. We don't have a legal system that protects whistleblowers. You know, so we need a system in place to provide legal protection for whistleblowers that are okay. looking to prevent. Mark? Yes. And and I appreciate that and, and thank you. But I, I still want to steer back to the question I asked you because we kind of got off, off topic slightly. And, okay. And, and I know we're having some starting and stopping here going on as well. So it's not uh, probably your, your fault even. Uh, I, I was asking you about this, this uh, the UN. In other words, the, the U.S. is being set up to be taken down. And I'm sure you're aware of that, right? Yes. Okay. And, and so what happens next? Because if you're in a situation where you are evaluating the financial takedown, and if you, if you are close to that or have special knowledge about that, is there anything that you can share with my audience um, that relates to, for example, what... what you could... dropped, I can't hear you. Oh. Can you hear me? Is there anything you can share about the financial takedown? Well, it's a question of math. Uh, the first thing you do when you're in the bottom of a hole is stop digging. We, took, we told the world today that we're going to continue to spend $85 billion a month propping up the stock market. Um, and so when we do that, so um, we have, you know, what can we do? I don't, you know. No, no, no. What I'm asking you is not what can we do. What I'm asking you is what do you know? In other words, are you close enough to the situation to where you can anticipate their next move? Well, you know, I think their next move will be, uh, you know, a false flag. Hello? Hello? Okay, you said you broke off at, at false flag attack. So you think there's going to be a false flag where and how? 
it, I'm not a mind reader. I mean, um, um, I, I think th <laughs> yeah. um, it would appear to me that um, a financial collapse is inev inevitable, uh, that the smart money knows this and that they've been stealing as much money as they can from as many people as, as they can, as fast as they can, and that we're going to have some type of an event um, and that uh, will result in, in the implementation of martial law. Okay. Okay. Uh, at this moment, Mark, can you hear me? Hello? Mark. Hello? Mark. Okay, everyone. Well, Carrie. Yes, okay, C can you hear me now? Hello? Carrie. Yes. Hello? Hello? Carrie, hello? <laughs> I'm here. Can you hear me? I can hear you now. <laughs> That's a bad joke. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, I think we need to wind this up because it's just getting ridiculous uh, to try to stay on the air with you any further. Uh, we have managed to get quite a bit of information, and I do appreciate your time. Um, I hope that you can okay. hear me. I hope the audience okay. can hear me right now. Well, the, the last time I had a program like this, I had a uh, splitting migraine for about three days. So um, I don't know if you heard what I heard through this whole thing. It sounded like an uh, like an uh, electronic symbol. No, we. I wasn't able to hear. I don't know if uh, other people were able to hear uh, you. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Hopefully we can, you know, uh, you know, take this forward in the future. Uh, Karen and I are working on, on, on some things. Um, we need all the help we can get. And, um, you know, the, the people themselves, information is not knowledge. Knowledge, information is something they give you. Knowledge is something you acquire. And so I want to thank people for, for taking the time. that they don't want the truth to get out. And if they're going to these levels to, uh, you know, silence truth tellers, um, you know, maybe this is something you should pay attention to. Absolutely. Listen to the whistleblowers. Uh, okay. Thank you very much, Mark Nowitzki, uh, and, and, and we really do appreciate your time. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Sorry we can't get to your questions. We are having too much interference at this time. Um, Mark, are you able to hear me saying this? And you're gone. Okay. All right. Thank you, everyone, uh, and, and good night. Okay. <laughs> Crazy. Uh, I appreciate your time. We're, we're used to this kind of stuff. So, <laughs> okay, Mark. Uh, so I was, I just asked you about how you viewed the Diane Feinstein kind of reversal and you were explaining, uh, that she should really be, uh, of course, and obviously she's, she's more than aware of the surveillance, all levels of the surveillance, nothing is a surprise. Um, but, but why the politicking? What, what do you think she, uh, she thinks she's going to achieve by that reversal? She's trying to save her own butt. Right. Um, she, she's realized now that the lights are on, that, uh, you know, that this is completely um, out of uh, the protectorate. Uh, and more and more knowledge is, you know, more and more information is coming out. And, again, I mean, I would like to applaud uh, Edward Snowden for what he's done. Um, it, you know, it took a tremendous amount of courage. And, actually, 
Uh, you know, anybody that's going to be critical of him, I think what he did was he, he took a critical analysis of the way whistleblowers were treated that were speaking out about domestic surveillance. And, and, and I, I, who I'm talking about are, you know, people like Michael Hastings, who was recently killed. Absolutely. Uh, and how about Aaron Schwartz? How about uh, Bradley Chelsea Manning? Um, and how about, uh, you know, President Obama going after whistleblowers with the bloodlust? Um, so he looked at what happened to Thomas Drake. He looked at what happened to William Binney. And he said, you know, this is information that has to get out. And anybody that would be critical of Ed Snowden, who said, and I can't in good conscience allow the U.S. government to destroy privacy, Internet freedom, and basic liberties for people around the world with this massive surveillance machine they're secretly building. Boy, what a, what a horrible guy. <laughs> now, okay, so I appreciate that, although I've got some mixed reviews in the background as far as, you know, the fact that he had help and, uh, and the fact that, that there is some kind of game playing going on with the Russians in this regard. Um, and I know you were on Russia Today, and, and there is there is a whole dynamic that, that I do want to kind of talk to you about. It's a more subtle level, but it has yes. to do with, uh, with kind of um, one-upmanship, if you will, between Russia and the U.S., uh, in other words, one surveillance committee calling, it's kind of like the, what they say, the, the pot call it, calling the, the pot black or whatever it is. You know what I'm the saying? Calling the kettle black. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, come on, let's, let's get real. I mean, didn't Russia basically invent the surveillance society and suddenly they're, they're holier than thou, they're above, above all this. Yeah, right. Uh, I don't believe that's how they conduct their, their business in their own country. And I also don't believe that they're not also reciprocally spying on us. Uh, so this is a, a very key thing to keep in mind and to balance the scales a little bit. We Yes, the NSA is, is this incredible uh, nefarious in, uh, sort of uh, intelligence agency, but, but we've got that uh, across the board. People are spying on people all around the world, agencies upon agencies. Uh, it, it's like... I think of it as like the Keystone Cops, to be honest. Um, <laughs> you know, they're okay. stumbling yeah. over each other to, to, to watch and listen to each other. It's craziness. Okay. Well, I, I, but what we need to talk about is legitimate versus illegitimate spying. Sure. I, am, I, I served in the United States military. Uh, MOS was 95 Bravo, 95 Char Char Charlie Combat Military Police and Corrections. I, I had some experience in psychological operations. And I understand that, you know, we need to direct our energies towards uh, uh, national security. But as has just been admitted publicly by the head of the NSA, by the director of national intelligence, and by the head of the fusion centers, they haven't been effective at doing that. And so uh, uh, apparently um, UPS guy could have figured out with, uh, uh, okay. so, so, you know, when we're being told, that, you know, domestic surveillance is our friend, um, that it's, it's protecting us. There's no evidence of that, and the evidence is all to the contrary. And, you know, th that can be clearly exhibited by, uh, I have to, your uh, Senator Feinstein. And uh, I would just like to talk to your audience about um, how completely clueless and incompetent and inept and dangerous she is. Um, she's head of the Senate Intelligence Committee, um, and she was the biggest cheerleader for the NSA, and she was the biggest protectorate of the NSA, and there wasn't a citizen she didn't feel that uh, uh, could not be spied upon. Um, so 10 years ago, when people like myself were trying to warn Congress, trying to warn the media, trying to warn the judiciary, that um, pretty much all of our communications are being monitored and recorded uh, and being held in, in, in a database. Um, you didn't have to be a terrorist or you didn't have to be on a terrorist watch list to have this happen. Um, Ten years ago, people would have looked at us like, you know, we're absolutely crazy, and now we all know that it's happening all over the world. But Dianne Feinstein, and it was very interesting because, again, if you looked at, um, you know, she referred to um, Edward Snowden as a traitor. 
and what he did was treason. And uh, she attacked anybody that would, uh, you know, go after the NSA and what they were doing. But something happened in the past week. I was kind of curious. And um, it was reported that uh, apparently the NSA has been spying on our allies and uh, our uh, allied diplomats up to the president level. So we're spying on countries like uh, Germany and Mexico and Spain and France. And uh, apparently that was where the straw that broke the camel's back as far as Diane Feinstein, because apparently it was okay with her if, you know, if the common people were, were spied upon. But she drew the line when uh, the NSA was spying on politicians. So suddenly, after all of this cheerleading and uh, going after and attacking whistleblowers like Ed Snowden, uh, when she found out that uh, the NSA was spying on politicians, she released a scathing statement. And she said, unlike the NSA's collection of phone records under a court order, which is a lie because they don't need a court order, it is clear to me that certain surveillance activities have been in effect for more than a decade and that the Senate Intelligence Committee was not satisfactorily informed. Therefore, our oversight needs to be strengthened and increased. She said, with respect to NSA collection of intelligence on leaders of U.S. allies, including France, Spain, Mexico, Germany, she left out Brazil, by the way, uh, Dilma uh, Rousseff, let me state unequivocally, I am totally opposed and she said, unless the United States is engaged in hostilities against a country or there is an emergency for this, uh, an emergency need for this type of surveillance, I do not believe the United States should be collecting phone calls or emails of friendly presidents and prime ministers. The president should be required to approve any collection of this sort. And in closing, she said, Congress needs to know exactly what our intelligence community is doing. To that end, the committee will initiate a major review of all intelligence collection programs. Right. Excuse okay. Me. Well, I mean, how do you how do you actually look at her reversal, though? Um, do you see it as superficial, or do you see it that she realized on on some sort of deep? Hello. Yes. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, we, we just had an interruption. Uh, hopefully, you're going to be seeing us shortly, even now. I think you can see us now. Uh, so, sorry about this. It's, uh, it's just one of those things. The, uh, of the uh, budget for the NSA goes to private contractors. And this is for the purpose of evading scrutiny by Congress and oversight and, you know, nasty things like uh, Freedom of Information Act requests. And... Um, from there, I did everything that, uh, you know, a whistleblower could do, but I found myself unemployable. And um, when you are a national security whistleblower, um, let me tell you, I, you know, the hurdles and boundaries put up against you. For one thing, um, it appeared as if I, the, my uh, prospective employers were being contacted and warning them not to employ me. So I had circumstances where... I had companies that I had interviewed with, and I was I was in demand. I had headhunters when I was working at Teletech at Nugent that were calling me basically on a weekly basis asking me about different opportunities. And um, so I disclosed to these prospective employers that, you know, I was in the process of, of being sued by my former employer, that the allegations were without merit. So I had full disclosure at the front end. And, uh, you know, after that, I told them that, you know, the case was dismissed with prejudice in my favor, meaning that Teletech could never come back after me uh, making the same allegations. Um, because, again, you know, the uh, allegations in the lawsuit was completely without merit. It never should have seen the light of day in the judicial system. Um, and I had things like um, a federal judge that was overseeing the case uh, came up to me in a settlement conference and, and put his arm around me and started to cry. And he said, Mark, um, if you were my son, I would tell you, just drop this. You can't win. Just, you know, um, um, you know, take it, uh, you know, let this go, um, get on with your life. And I, I looked at him and I said, I don't understand what you're telling me. I mean, you're, you're telling me that I don't have rights of due process or equal access to the courts. And I said, how do you come to work every day? You take an oath to God to protect the rights of the defenseless and the oppressed. And you're telling me that I can't compete. Uh, even though that I've done nothing wrong and the other side doesn't have any evidence to back up their claims. And, you know, this is, you know, 
by everybody's account, a, a hostile and malicious attack. Um, but it became then that I understood the power of domestic surveillance and how domestic surveillance was not being used in our national interest. It was being used as a weapon. It was being used against whistleblowers. It was being used against uh, government employees. It was being used against journalists. It was being used against lawyers. It was being used against judges. Um, it was being used for commercial purposes. Yeah, domestic surveillance was all about opposition research and control. So recently, when things like the fusion centers were actually forced to concede that, um, you know, they, despite, I, I forget when it was, $600 million dollars, in monies that were spent in developing these fusion centers, how many actual event, terrorist events that they had uh, negated or stopped or prevented, and they had to admit it was zero. And recently, um, uh, the head of the NSA, General Keith Alexander and, and James Clapper, the head of the Department of National Intelligence, um, were asked earlier how many um, uh, terrorist events they had uh, negated or prevented or uh, and uh, I think they, they said 54. Um, now they had to come back because I've never seen two people with the ability to lie and mislead and perjure themselves in front of Congress when they recently had to admit that, well, we think it's like one. We stopped one event, and that was a taxi driver, I think, in New York uh, that I believe was Somali, and he ended up sending back $1,000 to some Somali organization that was perhaps affiliated with a group. <laughs> right. Crazy. This is Carrie Cassidy from Project Camelot, and uh, we are going to be doing a live interview tonight with Mark Nowitzki, the National Security Whistleblower. And so I uh, hope everyone is, is ready for this. <laughs> Should be a lot of fun and very, very interesting. I do have Mark on the line right now. Mark, I, can you say hello? Hi, Carrie, and uh, thanks for the opportunity, and I appreciate uh, the, the uh, insightful people that are following your program. Excellent. Well, uh, I'm really happy to have you on the show, and uh, it, it's a lot of fun to, to kind of do this with you. Uh, we, we won't have any interruptions, at least by any formal commercials, although uh, I'm not sure what the live stream does. We do use a free part of their app, <laughs> just so you know. Uh, but eventually, this is going out over YouTube, as I mentioned to you, behind the scenes, and so everyone will know that if they miss any part of this, it will stay on live stream as well and be streamed uh, constantly at your your request, uh, but for free, and then also go on to YouTube. So so that's what we have going on with this interview tonight. So uh, we, we interviewed Karen Hudis actually a few times, and we did a live stream with her as well, and mm -hmm. um, a while back, as you know, and I know you work closely with her. So what I wanna do, I, I know you've got a subject you wanna go right into, but before you do that, I do want you to introduce yourself. Um, I've written a, a few things on the introduction, the article on my site about you, uh, linking over to that very uh, good article by uh, Preston James over at uh, Veterans Today. But I'd like you to kind of give your background kind of briefly, and we will go back in more depth into your background. So just say what you want at this point, and I'm glad to go into the topic that you want to discuss right from the get-go after that. Sure. Well, I kind of, you know, backed into being a uh, national security whistleblower. And as everybody can now imagine, uh, this is beyond national security. This is international security. And it, we are not any safer as a result of spying on every single American in the country, let alone literally every person in the world. Uh, we have been exponentially been made much more uh, in harm's way. Um, our allies no longer are our friends. Um, we have alienated and isolated ourselves. 
Um, and uh, our companies like uh, uh, Yahoo and Google and Facebook and, and Twitter, uh, our hardcore companies like uh, uh, Hewlett Packard are complaining that nobody wants to do business with us because they're afraid of backdoors in, in our uh, hardware, in our equipment. Um, and they're afraid of, you know, just opening Pandora's box and giving every information from a, from a country uh, to the United States government for, for purposes unknown, uh, friend and foe. Um, but uh, I, I started out um, in how I ended up being a national security whistleblower. Uh, I worked for a company called Teletech Holdings in Denver, Colorado. Uh, Teletech Holdings is a multi-billion dollar international holding company that uh, works in the industry of electronic customer relations management, uh, customer service, uh, international call centers. Um, so basically they interact at the customer service level for a variety of industries and services from telecommunications to retail to financial to healthcare. Uh, they also have a special subsidiary called Teletech Government Solutions that's involved with the uh, Department of Homeland Security, the FBI, with um, FEMA, and with the State Department. Um, I worked for a subsidiary called Nugent Results um, at the time. And again, I don't know how in-depth you want to go into this, but uh, uh, Nugent Results served the retail automobile industry. And uh, what we did for uh, manufacturers and retail uh, dealers throughout the country was uh, have access to the individual dealer's database and then marketed promotional materials to their customers. Um, but very soon, as a, a senior management level responsible for customer retention, customer satisfaction, um, I ascertained that the company was actually stealing from our customer base by using algorithms that were developed intentionally to deceive and defraud our customer base. And, and the company, by my estimations, was stealing between 30 and 40% in overbilling and fraudulent overcharges um, per month. Now, this represents a significant revenue. Um, and so the fact that they were aware of this and then, uh, you know, disclosing, failing to disclose this information to the shareholders um, actually uh, is securities fraud. Um, the other concern I had was that the company uh, was barely sharing information uh, based on information and belief um, from the dealerships to third parties, certainly without the knowledge or consent of the individual dealers. So what the company, you know, was doing and, and what I had uh, seen was that the company was sharing private, confidential, proprietary customer information um, with a third party without the individual dealer's knowledge or consent, um, which is a crime. And uh, ultimately, I ended up getting sued by Teletech and Federal Court in Denver. Um, the uh, lawsuit against me was completely without merit, uh, was not based on evidence, uh, you know, and it was, you know, a circus. It was a kangaroo court. Um, my attorneys, uh, my first attorneys actually um, ended up uh, quitting on me because they, uh, in, it's my belief that uh, they were um, they knew what was going on and they knew that they were going to be outspent. Um, I received a, a new set of attorneys and um, we ended up actually uh, basically uh, pro se on my part uh, forced a dismissal with prejudice against this multi-billion dollar corporation um, and I thought that my life would be you know fine and good. Um, what ended up happening as well in the very beginning of the lawsuit, and this happened in March of 2002, I received a warning from two former CIOs of the company saying that um, Teletech had the capacity uh, to wiretap my phone lines and read my ISP and that I was going to be under attack, um, that um, they considered me to be their number one priority um, and that they were going to litigate me to death and I would never work again. Now, this was in 2002, and people were starting to talk then about um, uh, domestic surveillance and the necessity for domestic surveillance. Um, and after the dismissal of the lawsuit, I, I had received numerous threats 
uh, I won the dismissal, and I thought, well, great, I can I can uh, resume my life. And um, but what I found out was that I was literally unemployable. Um, it appeared that I was put on some type of a list, and uh, I had uh, foreknowledge that Teletech was involved in things like uh, uh, the establishment of the terrorist watch list. Now, when people think of the NSA, the National Security Agency, it should really be called the PSA for the private security agency because 